Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is State Representative Tom Morrison. I represent the 54th District, and I'm joined by colleagues uh, to talk about a constitutional amendment that I filed this morning, House Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment 34. We as House Republicans remain opposed to Governor J.B. Pritzker's plans to erase the flat income tax protection for the Illinois Constitution. What we're hearing from our residents is um, that the advertising campaign around the state is that supposedly the income tax increase would only affect a very small percentage of Illinoisans, and we believe that there need to be protections for taxpayers, whether it's income tax or any other tax. Uh, we need greater protections for taxpayers, and so that's why I filed this legislation. Uh, the governor himself, when talking with ABC News, admitted that there were no guarantees that the rates that he has proposed would remain in place. And so what we believe is, especially on the income tax, that is, would be a divide and conquer strategy. That would be ultimately bad for taxpayers, it would be bad for the state, it would be bad for business owners in the state and job creators. The purpose of the legislation I filed is simple. Whereas the Constitution provides for a flat income tax and it would take a super majority to change the Constitution, going forward it just takes a simple majority to raise taxes and we believe that that is not a great enough protection to taxpayers. It should be difficult to raise taxes. Requiring a supermajority vote if lawmakers want to place new burdens on taxpayers is an important layer of protection. I have a couple dozen co-sponsors on my legislation. We're still working on it. Um, but at this point, I would like to turn over the podium to my colleague, uh, Representative Deanna Mazaki. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deanne Mazaki. I represent the 47th District, which is Eastern DuPage and a little bit of Cook County. Um, so this is a new legislation. a new legis Later, this is my first Springfield tax debate, but unfortunately, we have a history of tax debates in Springfield, and they tend to be one-sided, which is that one side promises that they are going to actually increase our tax rates and that doing so will actually solve the structural uh, spending problems in the state. They promised it in 1970 when they said we were going to actually have a state income tax. They promised it again in 2011. They promised it again in 2017 when it was supposedly going to get rid of our bill backlog. It doesn't work because Springfield won't make the structural constitutional reform that is needed to control our future spending. And when it comes to good government, this new income tax is going to corrupt our legislature further, not reform it. Our property tax system is a mess because its endless list of threatened increases, variable deductions, it enables pay to play. Earlier this year, it was reported, for example, that Madigan and Getzendanner won $1.7 billion in assessed value reductions in Cook County alone. What do you think is going to happen once no one has to pay the same rate for the same kind of income and you can do that with just a simple majority? If you let this cat out of the bag, we're going to get an army of income tax lobby lawyers who are going to descend down on Springfield. We're going to get more pay to play, more insider privilege, and taxpayers across the state will lose. I support CA 34 because by giving that an up or down vote on the floor, we can at least make sure that taxpayers are going to get a little bit more protection than they currently are under the governor's proposal. So thank you very much. And let me introduce Representative Lindsay Parkers from the 79th District in Kankakee. Hi, thank you. I'm Representative Lindsay Parkhurst. I represent the 79th District, which includes Kankakee, Piatone, and Coal City, to name a few. We have already seen the rates, the Senate already increased the rates before they even uh, voted on the bill. So the rates are subject to change and they will change. The amendment is simple. If the proponents of the graduated tax are truly committed to protecting the middle class, they need to make sure the rates are constitutionally protected by supporting a two thirds vote to change the rates in the future. This is a simple amendment and it, you really need to put your money where your mouth is. If you truly want to protect the middle class, then the amendment shouldn't be a problem for the proponents of the graduated tax. I urge uh, that everybody vote for it. Thank you. Um, before we take questions, I really want to give credit uh, to my friend and colleague, Senator Dan McConkey. Uh, this was his language that he introduced in the Senate, and uh, many of us believe it was not given uh, proper attention by the majority party, and so that's why we're reintroducing here in the House. We're happy to take questions. Well, one thing I hear uh, regularly is Republicans have absolutely zero power whatsoever, zero influence. You guys are in a super minority. Is this just box you 
manufacturing or how are you going to get across to the super majority that this is what is, in your opinion, the best move forward? Well, what we're hearing, I mean, we, we all represent districts. We're all listening to our constituents back home, and we're also seeing that in neighboring districts represented by uh, Democratic representatives, that taxes are one of the biggest issues that our constituents are facing. And so whether it's property taxes or income tax, uh, income taxes, taxes are a big concern, and uh, we want to make sure that there are protections in place for taxpayers. This is why you haven't seen some of these bills just uh, rush through, I mean, the, ta the tax increase bills. And there have been a number proposed this year and in past years, you know, bag tax, um, uh, the gas tax, um, tobacco taxes, sugary drink taxes, financial transaction taxes, uh, taxes on health insurance claims, uh, video streaming. Uh, a lot of these um, have been stopped because they, would, they are broadly applied, and so therefore they're unpopular. But if we change, if, if Governor Pritzker and his allies change the Constitution on the income tax, um, it will be a divide and conquer strategy. And you're seeing it right now in the advertising where they're saying, well, it's only going to affect a very small percentage of the population. But if that is really the case, then the majority party should have no concern putting this in as an additional sh safeguard. Is this a negotiating uh, strategy or is this a messaging campaign? Is there any condition under which if you got this constitutional amendment with the supermajority, maybe tweaking the rates to give you know, a, a lower rate to some of the people on the lower end of the income scale, would anyone vote yes for the progressive income tax or is this just promoting this one resolution? I, I'm, sp I'm speaking here for myself. I mean, I can tell you that I've talked to constituents who I'm opposed to the, the governor's uh, proposed constitutional change on income tax. But what I'm hearing from some constituents is they, they question, well, why are you so opposed? I mean, this is only going to affect a very small segment of society because they're, they're believing the commercials out there, the you know, millions of dollars spent that are trying to purport this as a tax on just the very few when really it would open the door to tax just about everyone easier. Right now, when you see, when you have seen the, the, the tax debates we've had in 2011 and then again in, in uh, 2017, because the tax was broadly applied, um, a lot of people were upset about it. And if the governor's proposal goes through, it would be easier to just divide, divide and conquer. I guess an example, though, is if they cut that income tax rate for the people under $250,000 a year down to 3.75 percent, is there any structure like that that you would support if you were guaranteed those protections of a supermajority? I don't, I don't think the leadership in Springfield on the Democratic side, I don't think they can be trusted because, again, in 2011, we were promised that it was a temporary income tax. And then what we saw is in 2012, 2013, 2014, the levels of spending that necessitated that those tax rates become per permanent. Yeah, I, I think it's not an, an honest debate. There's a belief that, well, it's just going to affect, um, it's not going to affect me. It's not going to affect my neighbor. It's not going to affect my friends. But this legislature has an appetite to spend and an appetite to create new programs. And so um, even those who have told me that they might be willing to pay more in income tax, they don't have confidence that it is actually going to pay down our, our structural uh, uh, deficits and debts. And actually, if I can follow up on your question, um, one of the interesting things that I've seen about some polling data is that, in fact, everybody, when, when people say that they're in favor of it, it's when they're at an income level where they don't think they're going to have to pay the increased amount. As soon as people start believing that they actually will have to start paying that increased amount, then the support actually starts to drop dramatically. And that's, I think, why this is why one of the, this is important for us to actually have this in place, is because we want people to be able to realize that if, in fact, the Senate um, and the House and the legislators here in Springfield are not willing to lock in those rates and they're not willing to commit to a supermajority, you know, if they really wanted to actually say that the bottom 97% don't get a tax increase, why are they not saying let's reduce that down to 3.25%? The reason why they're not doing that is because they know they need the money of the working class and the middle class in order to balance their spending budget. Well, yeah, we asked Speaker Madigan about this when the Senate, when Senator McConkie raised it, and he said he's not, or his spokesman said he's not in the habit of giving outsized power to the minority party. 
<laughs> well, but, but, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that he's going to have to deal with the fact that this constitutional amendment is going to be on the ballot. So it's not a question of giving power to the minority party. The minority party has a duty to let people know what it is they're actually voting for and make sure they have the truth and make sure they're not going to be suffering under some bait and switch proposal because of a bunch of TV commercials. Well, now what makes you think your amendment is going to be on the ballot? What makes us think our amendment is going to be on the ballot? Well, to me, the better question is, is why is it that the Senate and Republicans majority is opposed to this being on the ballot? If, in fact, they're true to the statements that they're telling the public right now, what's their objection? Well, uh, if they're going to have an objection, it's because they really do plan on making this a bait and switch strategy and they're going to raise the rates. Answer my question. I, I thought I was answering I, I your question. You, did. you said, what's their objection? And I said, what, what makes you think that it's going to get on the ballot? And I, I'd like to answer that. I, right. I can we, sure, go ahead. Oh, are you, okay, so. Why, why do you think your amendment is going to get on the ballot? Well, we have to file it. And so it was, we filed identical language to what was filed in the Senate weeks ago. And the fact is that this, the, the Senate and the Senate president did not take it up. And so we're, we're doing our best. We're doing a duty to our taxpayers to bring it up here in the House while there's still time this May. Oh, um, I mean, we just finished spending a couple of weeks back in our districts. A lot of us held town hall meetings. A lot of us had meetings with constituents. And so I think our primary concern is making sure that we are standing up for them. I don't, I, I assume that Democratic colleagues did the same in their districts. And again and again and again, what you're hearing across the state is taxes are a major problem in the state of Illinois, whether it's property taxes, income taxes, or these other proposals out there. Where are the spending reforms that would protect the state rather than just keep going, continuing to go back to the well of taxpayers and saying you're going to have to pay more because of a lack of fiscal discipline here in the, in the General Assembly? This so morning there was like an audit out of DC. No longer with the, the General Assembly? I, I don't have a comment. I don't know if anybody else does. But. There was an audit this morning about DCFS showed after the uh, tax cut that took effect at the beginning of 2015, things really got bad there, right? Call time, response time really went down. Fewer investigations were being conducted, caseloads went up. How do you reconcile the poor outcomes we saw during the budget impasse with this desire to crimp revenue in the state of Illinois as Democrats are trying to increase it? Well, there were a host of things that went wrong, uh, obviously, with the budget impasse from DCFS to a, a lot of – it was not a good time for the state of Illinois. But the point is, if we're unable to or unwilling to push for structural reforms in how we spend money, then we're going to be perpetually in a situation where we cannot prioritize funds to our human service providers. But how do you arrive at two-thirds? What's that? How do you arrive at two-thirds? Um, there are uh, several other states that have this two-thirds provision. California is one. Wisconsin is another. Uh, Missouri. I have a complete list here, but there are other states that have two-thirds. Some have three-fifths. Uh, there's a handful of states that even have a three-fourths. Oklahoma has a three-fourths requirement. Uh, in their legislature. So two-thirds is, a, is a, uh, the number we landed on. All right. Thanks, guys. Is that to impose or raise any tax? Impose a new one, raise any existing one? That's correct. Uh, the, you can read the language. It's HJRC 30, uh, HJRCA 34. 